Okay, it's your first week at work. Maybe you started a new job. Maybe, maybe you just got out of boot camp. Maybe you've been doing this for 15 years. And there's a bug, and you have a task in your ticketing system. Maybe it's JIRA. Maybe it's Pivotal Tracker. Maybe you're blessed with Linear <laughs> or some other better tool. And you're working on this bug, and it's an e-commerce site. And you notice there's a bug with the price. So you're in Ruby. Maybe you know Ruby really well. Maybe you don't. But you see in this file, productcomponents.html.erb, you see this code. It looks like HTML, and then it's got B stings. That's what those are called, B stings. <laughs> and you have an instance variable called product, a method called name. Maybe it's an attribute or a method. They're kind of all the same in Ruby. And then you have a price. And you think, all right. We must have a bug in product.price. Well, what is product? So you open the Ruby component, and you see this code. And there's a bunch of stuff, but in particular, we pass in a parameter of product, and we assign it to an instance variable of product. <laughs> and there's an attribute reader, which basically lets you get that value publicly and not set it. That's pretty elegant, I guess. But what is the product parameter? Is it the product model? Rails is this MVC framework, so model, view, controller. So then you might go and look at this and go, oh, this is probably the product model. And that might be safe to assume, but you know what they say about assuming. And we want to look through the source code and actually figure out what it is. So let's find out what product is. So we want to see what initialize. That's an emoji that it can't render. Um, so we want to see what product component is. And we go and we search through the code base for product component, that constant. And we see that it's rendered in this file called productListComponent.html.erb, different than the one we were just in. And we have some code rendered, outputs some HTML, basically, with this collection, which is an array of products. OK, <laughs> what's products? Well, to figure that out, we need to open up this Ruby file called ProductListComponent. It looks pretty similar to the other code we were looking at, right? Products. It's a parameter. <laughs> we assign it to a variable, which we can then read publicly. But we still don't know what product is. We don't know what products really is. So then we need to figure out, OK, well, what instantiates product list component? So we search and we try to find out. But remember, we're just trying to find out how this one method is implemented. So OK, we open up index.html.erb. This is what's known as like a list view in Rails world. It's usually called index. And we see some more markup. This is ERB, but basically it's just HTML with some Ruby in it. And we see another component <laughs> that renders products. And it's at sign products, so it's an instance variable, not a local variable. <sighs> What's at sign products? So we go and we know we've been using Rails for 14 years. And we go and we know it's in the index action. That matches that index file name. That's the kind of magic of Rails you hear about. And we have products. And it's assigned. Oh, but it's calling out the product service because we don't want to have a bunch of code in this index. So we have product service. It takes the request parameters. And it calls a method filtered products with this other filters variable. So, so we still don't actually know what we have. Um, so, but let's go check. So we go into product service. And this makes a database query in Rails world. That doesn't really matter. But we see that products is basically an array of this class product. So we're, <laughs> we're close. We know it's product. And then we have this method where we pass some junk in. And we cache it, right? so it's trying to be performant. And we'll zoom in a little. And we see that we select all of those that are applied to the filter. And then we map them into a product preview instance. So aha, product preview. <laughs> we finally found it after six or seven files. That is the type of the object we're working with in that code that we initially looked at. But what defines price? So trying to find this bug. Remember, it's our first day. We, we want everyone to like us. So we go and we try to find what price is defined by. So we open a product preview, which is meant to be a very easily cacheable object, because we want to cache things. Um, and we find format currents, format for currency. And we pass in the price of the product, and we pass in the params to determine the locale, to determine which currency to display it in, based on the user's IP address or whatever. But we don't see format for currency. So where's that coming from? Oh, it's coming from preview base <laughs> using inheritance. <laughs> so 
Yes, we have to go up the tree and find that this is coming from inheritance. So we finally found it. And this, to me, is the nightmare. This is the nightmare of dynamically typed languages, and in particular Ruby, but I know this also applies to Python and a little bit to JS, although JS has gotten a lot better in ways that I would argue Ruby hasn't and hasn't, has failed to innovate, or not even innovate, but improve the developer experience. So to me, all of this was so obtuse to just find out what that product object was and required digging through so many files. And I'm only slightly exaggerating. This isn't exact code from code bases I work in, but this is basically it simplified. And yes, I know, <laughs> you're going, those are terrible patterns you're using, Brett. <laughs> you're misapplying patterns. Um, you could just throw in a debugger, right? Or you know, there's this thing called sorbet, which is typing for Ruby. You could just throw that in. You could write comments, but then you'll get pull request comments saying, comments aren't very, very useful. You need to write code that you can understand. And <laughs> you don't need the comments. They'll just be out of date, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. And the thing is, I didn't write this code, right? And if you work anywhere on a non-trivial software application with a non-team of you, there's code like this. And that's because people were doing the best they could at the time with the knowledge they had and the time and the priorities that were set. So this isn't like meant to slam bad code. And some of this is just copied from the docs of some of these Ruby gems. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, there's an issue here. Now, let's just take that code we first looked at and put it in TypeScript. So product preview, remember how long it took us to find product preview before? It's the first thing in the thing. We have the, basically the adder reader equivalent. We know it's product preview, and then we have a constructor, which is just like those initializers, and we know that it's of type product preview. Completely different. A little bit more verbose. People might say less elegant, but there's no contest for, like, you don't get paid more for writing elegant code. The software's not better for writing elegant code um, or shorter code. It's not code golf. And so to me, this is a lot more clear, a little more verbose. But we instantly know what that product parameter is. And to me, I've been living this nightmare for 14 years. <laughs> please save me. That is what this talk is. I'm just begging you, please. I need career advice. I need life advice. I've been trapped in Rails for 14 years. And I have not been able to escape. And I keep doing things that keep me in that world. So I need help, clearly. There's something wrong with me not just Ruby. So I'm Brett, I'm a full stack web application developer. I have this baby, I work for this company called Framework that makes computers. They're actually leaving next week to just hang out with my baby and talk and think about this stuff. Um, do some freelance work and Framework makes nice computers and um, so that's great if you like computers. <laughs> I have a MacBook and that, this is nothing about Framework. I just like Mac OS. <laughs> I'm co-chair of our local DSA chapter. If you're feeling frustrated with capitalism, if you find yourself thinking, why are we just killing so many innocent civilians? Like, if you're just frustrated with what's going on, um, come talk to me. Um, I'm also part of the National Tech Committee, so we use open source software to destroy capitalism. So <laughs> if you're interested, um, come, come talk with me. <laughs> and. Um, I love creative dabbling, so I like drawing and making little games and zines and videos and just kind of all this stuff. And that's one of the fun things about technology. I wrote this book. This is part of me being sick. Is like wrote a book on making games with Ruby <laughs> when I want to get out of Ruby. But I wrote this free book. If you're interested in like making games with Ruby, it's a free online book. Um, so I like game programming, web programming. I like making CLIs. I've done a bunch of dabbling with other languages, so I'm not just like indoctrinated in this one language as it being the best language. I feel like I've used quite a few different things. And I don't hate Ruby, that's the thing. <laughs> I don't hate it, and it's really comfortable. I can just open up a file in Ruby and just like write a bunch of code and not have to look anything up, not have to you know, dig into how things work. I'm very comfortable with it, but I'm also frustrated by it. And JavaScript wasn't much better. <laughs> like 10 years ago, you could, everything was just global, especially in the browser. Like if people use Backbone or um, Marionette and jQuery, it was pretty rough 10 years ago. But JavaScript's innovated a lot in a way that Ruby hasn't. And whenever I think about talking about programming languages, I think of the end of Blade Runner. <laughs> everything just seems so dramatic. I always think in my head, the great language wars. We're sort of living through them. It's, it's very trying times. Should I choose Rust? Should I choose Go? 
what should I do? Oh, there's this new language, Zim, <laughs> whatever. Like, it's just like a total nightmare to be a programmer, in my opinion. <laughs> but something I've been thinking a lot about while preparing this talk and while at work is how do we choose languages and who's choosing them? And why are we choosing them? Who's evaluating them and upon what criteria? And are we being intentional about them? And this is something where I haven't been intentional. <laughs> I happened to get a job when I was 18 using Rails, and then it was just like, you could get jobs doing Rails. And like within a week, or like first day on a job with Rails, you could jump in and like be productive, which is like pretty amazing. Like if you think about that in terms of like, just replace me with AI. <laughs> Like, it was basically like proto just like cogging people, right? And just making me like very replaceable. But it was really cool to be productive instantly. But something happened where it's just like working with different places and being frustrated with languages or languages not meeting the needs of the team but not making decisions intentionally about that. Maybe that says more about where I've worked, but I find it pretty challenging. And so I think about a lot of things when I think about programming languages. My productivity, team's productivity, this idea of foot guns, which is like how easy it is for you to shoot yourself in the foot, <laughs> which Ruby is like foot guns to the maximum, um, which I'll show some more foot guns in a moment. Um, how comfortable is the language? Ruby, very comfortable. It's like a, like a cozy set of pajamas and a blanket. Um, but how clear is it? Ruby, like absolutely not clear. <laughs> um, so it's like I'm thinking about all these things. I used to say to myself, as I'm organizing a Ruby programming conference, as I'm writing these books about Ruby, like, any language is good. It's just about you making interesting things. But I just really don't agree with that anymore. <laughs> That's kind of what this talk is about. Like, your language choice, I think, matters. And so five years ago at a past job, one day, I don't know if anyone's ever worked with anyone like this, but there was just no one to say no to this co colleague, friend, Dearly love this person, very smart, really respected. But just one day it was like, we're putting TypeScript in. And there was no one to say no. So forced into learning TypeScript. And this is, the, this, is this meme about like the Vim learning curve, <laughs> which is very true. <laughs> and I felt TypeScript was the same way. It was like a solid year of trying to figure out what to do with TypeScript, how it works, how to make the compiler happy, being really frustrated and really resenting this person, introducing TypeScript without discussing it or making an engineering decision democratically or sort of considering it and getting feedback. So I was forced into it and really hated it, really, really frustrated. But then this thing started to happen a year in where it was like, oh, the, the compiler was helping me. <laughs> and the code I was writing was like more clear. And I was having to be more considerate about like what each function was returning and what I was passing into it. And it sort of was like, oh, this is kind of nice. <laughs> oh, I kind of like this. And then it just shifted. And what I realized is that I really prefer clear code over clever code. And if you didn't write Ruby 10, 15 years ago, it was about how clever can you be. That was the entire community vibe, which is how clever can we make this? And it leads to nice APIs if you never have to go below the surface. But when you're actually having to dig into and use those APIs and change them, really difficult and obtuse. And something I realized is that my taste has changed. I don't, no one ever really talks about that, but like how much we use a language is pretty personal. Maybe you're forced into doing it. Maybe it's a project requirement. Like maybe you want to build like an iPhone app. You kind of have to use Swift, basically. Um, but there are times where we do have choices, and I realize that my preferences change. So let's talk about a couple more ways Ruby's gross. So you can just open any class and just like override methods. So like here's a string of foo length three. You can just like open string up <laughs> and make length always hard code ten. Um, that's scary, right? <laughs> that's that's objectively a bad idea. And you might think, well, no one would do that. You're just like being silly up here. But like this is like what Rails is based upon. <laughs> Right? This is like the foundation of the Ruby on Rails framework is like making string convenient, but then they like re-implement stuff pretty poorly and inefficiently, and then it gets fixed and it gets better, but you just like don't know where the stuff is coming from. So you use Rails for 10 years, and then you open up a Ruby file, and then you realize string doesn't have all these nice methods because they just monkey patched them in. And you, just you don't know where anything comes from. So like let's say you use the Stripe gem to capture payments. Well, here's legit code. Like That's like what the code would be if you opened it in your editor. Well, what is Stripe? Well, it comes from the gem file. You just add that one magic line, and you run bundle install, and then you have just a global Stripe. 
And if you're really like next level, you monkey patch that <laughs> and you add your own stuff. And uh, that's like if you really want to go. And then there's this thing called metaprogramming. You can go and read books about it. And you can basically define code that defines code. So let's say we want to call example.new.test and it returns the test string or whatever, outputs it to standard out. Um, but then if you go and search for like def test or test in the code, it doesn't show up. <laughs> so you're like, what? where is this coming from? <laughs> this is like, it's, it's nice, but it's awful. And so my take on this, and maybe the whole summary of the talk is that people think that that stuff's productive. People think that stuff is nice. What I would say is it's not worth the overhead and the indirection that comes with it, especially when you work on non-trivial software, larger code bases with teams that aren't just you or teams that aren't just a couple of people. That's kind of my stance today. It might change tomorrow. And this is what I really like about TypeScript. I like the static typing. I like that it's higher level than Rust or Go, especially for the kind of programming I'm doing. Um, you can do a lot more with it than just like making like a box expand and contrast <laughs> or collapse like you could 15 years ago at jQuery. It's come a long way. And there's a lot of open source packages. And I have fun writing it. That's probably like the biggest thing. I've also really been enjoying writing functional code with TypeScript. There's a nice match there, especially coming out of like inheritance and like OO stuff from Ruby. But it's not perfect. The standard library is like terrible uh, in JavaScript. Um, there's a lot of configuration, which is, that's like a whole meme in and of itself. And you can get out of control with the types and interfaces. But no language is perfect. My dream would be if I could just have one language to do all these things, the things I like doing. Little command line apps, scripts on my computer, web applications so I can get paid to destroy these companies that are paying me, uh, building APIs working with databases and apps and games. And I want it to be expressive and clear. I want it to be quick to just like jump in and like make a little project uh, with little config. And that led me to this thing called Dino, which I don't know how much people know about Dino. It's like every week there's a new JavaScript runtime. You might have heard of Bun, <laughs> which came out after Dino, which is a little faster than Dino. But Dino has some cool things that Bun doesn't. So, it's, it's like the equivalent of Node.js. So if you've installed Node and you've installed packages, Dino is what you would install instead of Node.js. So it uses the same language um, specifications, but it's written in Rust. You get TypeScript out of the box. It's much faster than Node.js. And it feels like if someone who loved Rust and Go was like, I want to kind of make that for TypeScript and JavaScript. And that's what Dino is. And it's really cool. It's, you can do most of those things. There's a command. You can just run Dino compile, and it compiles your TypeScript into a binary for any platform that you can just like run your command line app on, which is really nice. I've built a bunch of CLIs with it. And um, yeah, Dino is cool. So if, <laughs> if there's one takeaway from all this rambling, you're like, hmm, maybe Dino would be cool to check out. So for me, when I was thinking about all this, is like, I want to keep writing more TypeScript. That would be like a career goal, would <laughs> be like, stop writing Ruby. Uh, if I could get out of that, that would be great. I would love advice on how to do that. <laughs> I would like to dabble with other languages. I think Dino is really interesting to follow along with. And um, for career, it's like, I don't know. It's like when you do e-commerce for 14 years in this language that you've kind of come to like be totally uninterested in, I find myself feeling a little stuck and a little, uh, little tired. So that's why I'm sort of taking a break. I have another baby on the way. Just gonna like hang out and be a dad, and like code will be here after. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>